are interested in writing, I pray that you would use this teaching time to prepare them for what you have for them. Lord, we know you're coming soon, and we want to be about your business in these last days. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> All right. So, last time we ended talking about personal testimony stories, and I gave you in your handouts all different kinds of stories because each story is unique and there's a different way to approach it in the interview. Now, there's general interview guidelines that we talked about last time. Did we talk about those last time? Yes, you did. <laughs> okay. Um, so the challenge with personal testimonies, we'll just say a, a little bit about personal testimonies before we move on to the other kinds. The challenge with personal testimonies, as our other writers have talked about, are here's a person's life, how do you boil it down to 850 words, and how do you have a cohesive message um, and a, a point, a focus? Um, and that is a good question. That is a real challenge with personal testimony stories, but the Lord will show you. Just know that you do have to have a point and you do have to cut some things out. And you're gonna feel guilty for cutting out good things, but if they don't have anything to do with the main point of the personal testimony, they're probably gonna have to go. Um, and that's what, if you hand in a 1500 word personal testimony story, that's what the editor <laughs> will do. They'll just have to cut out everything that doesn't have anything to do with that main heart of the story. Um, uh, one example, if I can share, um, uh, one of our writers was talking to me about a lady who has, um, she's gone through many trials and challenges in her life and she's a teacher at a public school and she has a huge missionary heart for her students. She just sees herself as a missionary in the public school system um, and she tries her best to represent the Lord and her relationships with her students. Well, she also had all these other things going on in her life and other things that she'd been through and the testimony of when she got saved. So of course we cannot include all of that because if we include all of that, we're gonna lose the heart of the story. Because even having too many things will lessen the impact of the one thing that you hope will really stand out. Just like if I tell you 10 things, you may or may not remember all 10, but if I tell you one thing, then you'll remember that one thing. So <clears throat> it is hard with the personal testimonies to not tell the person's entire life story. You're gonna wanna do that, <laughs> but you can't. And so just know that, just know that that's one of the challenges. Um, so this, this person decided to focus on this woman, her heart for her students as a public school teacher and why that was such a passion for her and what she saw as she looked at her public school students and she saw and felt God's heart for them. And remember, that always comes back to what is God's heart in this story? And in her story, we could have talked about many different things, her marriage, her testimony of getting saved, her background. We could have talked about so many things, but we, uh, the writer chose to talk about that heart, God's heart for those public school children and sending his servant into the midst of them every single day to work in a very challenging and difficult and secular environment uh, with very limited... Um, She's very limited in what she can say and when she can say it and how she can say it, but even with all those challenges, just how important that ministry is and how, for this woman, it's worth her, her time, her livelihood. You know, she could be doing something else, but she's doing that. So <clears throat> that is the challenge with personal testimony stories. And some really great examples in our archives, we have a wonderful personal testimony about Patty Height. Who God saved out of homosexuality and now she's going around speaking at all kinds of places churches conferences retreats youth women adults the whole church about how to minister to people who are in the homosexual lifestyle um, but her own testimony is so such a powerful story of how God can change a life but also I felt like her story was really powerful with if we obey the Lord even if it's really hard one step at a time, he will do amazing things. Even if it goes against every grain of our feelings and our emotions and how we were raised, if we will obey his word, one step at a time, Jesus will transform us. I thought that was a beautiful truth that any believer could benefit from um, 
Then we had um, another really powerful story is Nanette Gonzalez, a single lady who was a banker who went to Romania to work with orphans, uh, and that's an issue 23. Patty Height is an issue 65. Nanette is an issue 23. And then we had another really powerful one. Um, we called it Journey Through Illness, and it wasn't just a personal testimony. It, was, it wasn't just a one-page personal testimony, but it was about pastors who were battling cancer and their struggles, and their very real, honest struggles. Why did God allow this? I'm serving him, what their wives went through. Um, but it, because it was so honest, I think it was very powerful because many of us go through really life-shaking struggles, and to hear the ins inside, what was going on inside these men as they were going through those things was really powerful. Um, so those are the challenges and the blessings with personal testimony stories. All right, let's go to page 18. And this is about um, church features. Now a church feature is almost like a testimony story of a church. What has God been doing in this church? What makes it unique from all other Calvary chapels or other churches? Um, what has been the change that the Lord has done? How is he touching people's lives? So it's, it's interesting. It's kind of like a testimony of the whole church. It's also very difficult, just like the personal testimony, because you're going to want to tell the entire, could be 4,000 word story of how the church got started and the pastor and his wife and how they moved to this city and how they, and depending on what the Lord shows you is the heart of the story, you can't. You cannot tell their whole entire church history. Plus, you'll lose the reader. And we have to remember, sometimes we, we, ha we have to remember that we're writing for the reader. Because sometimes we might think, oh, I'm writing this personal testimony for this person. Or I'm writing this church feature story for this church. And that's hard, because then you're going to get caught up in things that might be kind of sentimental to the person or the church, but to the reader aren't really going to mean that much. You know? Mm -hmm. um, so try to... Our focus is always, what is the Lord doing? What is the Lord doing? And with a church feature, you, you do need to find something unique because all churches have Sunday morning church. They all have a children's ministry. <laughs> they all have a women's ministry. Um, a lot of them do vacation Bible school. So you really have to try to plug into the heartbeat of that church. What is the heartbeat? And I, I really do love about Calvary Chapel, how every single Calvary Chapel is different and has its own personality. Um, we've talked before about how some churches in a military community, they have sort of a military mindset and a, an atmosphere and, uh, and some churches out in the country, you know, they're more community focused or, you know, more, um, uh, uh, everyone in the town knows everybody. And so, um, lots of fellowship opportunities. Um, but every church has its own personality. Every church is different. And I think every church has a special calling from God. Of course, to reach the lost, of course, to teach the word. But um, some of our church features have been really interesting. Um, like some churches have a huge heart for missions. One church that we featured was Calvary Chapel, Delaware County in Pennsylvania. They had a huge heart for the homeless, the needy, um, those from underprivileged backgrounds, broken homes. Uh, and it, it was so neat because it wasn't just the pastor who wanted to reach all these people. He was the enabler, the encourager of the body to say, what has God put on your heart? What is your passion? And, and some people, one man had a passion for adult literacy. And so he said, well, I, I'd be willing to give of my time to teach adults to read. And then God made a ministry out of that. And then another uh, group of people said, well, we want to go down, since it was close to Philadelphia, they wanted to go down to all the thousands of homeless that are in that area and they wanted to interact with them and be there and so uh, it was just a beautiful story of all these like all these different ways that the Lord was reaching out to the needy through this one church and how it was the believers the believers in the church who had the Lord's heart and who were reaching out there was even a young lady who uh, decided to start reaching out through social media she's like well I know how to do social media so she started sharing Jesus with like her um, her age group through social media and just, um, so every, every church is different. They might look the same in a lot of ways, but, and it's, it's the challenge for the writer 
with all the interviewing and all the research to find what is that unique aspect? What has the Lord done? What have they learned that we could share that the whole Calvary Chapel family could be uh, instructed by? Um, we had another church that, um, and we really were looking for special needs ministries. And as, as our writer went out looking, we found this church that just had a huge heart. And the pastor and his wife had a special needs child, and I think the assistant pastor and his wife had a special needs child. So you could see why they had this huge heart. But really, we know that there are special needs individuals in just about every church in America. And so we felt like that was a really important story, and so that was the angle that we really took. And it was a church feature in a way, but it was really about special needs ministry. And so that's that's what a church feature can look like. It doesn't have to be, this is how the church started, this is when it started, this is, you know, really look for something unique, really look for something that stands out to you or really shows God's heart. Um, um, what is the church overcome, faced and overcome together? So essential things that you're going to have in a church feature are specific antidotes of significant works of God, somebody's salvation, or rededication to Christ, or uh, in, in this case, I think it was a special needs family who had just been feeling like uh, outcasts. They just never really felt welcome by any church that they went to, but they desperately needed to be in a church and they desperately needed to be ministered to because it's so hard to be a special needs family and how the Lord drew them into this one church and how um, how they had learned to reach out to special needs families. And we even actually did like a bullet point list at the end of ways that a church can make themselves more welcoming to special needs families. So it was really, really valuable article that came out in this last issue, uh, 76? Yes. yes. <laughs> um, oh, we did a story, and it's, remember, you have to think of the things that are really engaging. So we had a church, they were having their anniversary, I don't know if it was their 20 year anniversary or their 30 year anniversary as a church, and they were really excited about that. And they said, oh, it's our 30 year anniversary as a church, that's what we want you to write about. But as the writer, that's great that it's their 30 year anniversary, but that doesn't reflect the Lord's heart. That doesn't reflect the Lord's passion. What is the Lord's passion? It's always people. It's not really anniversaries, right? And so as I interviewed um, for that story, I interviewed, you know, you always, usually you start with the pastor, the leadership, and then you, you go on to maybe some other people on staff, and then you're looking for the everyday person um, so I interviewed and interviewed and interviewed for that story. Oh my goodness, I must have interviewed a dozen people, which you don't really want to interview a dozen people for every story because you can't quote a dozen people. But we finally found a young man who had gotten saved and he had been a youth and gotten saved through their outreaches to the youth and now he was involved in the church and serving and reaching out as a young man. And so it was a neat picture of, yes, it's been many years, of them reaching out and now there's this fruit many years later is still lasting so that was good because you you want fruit that's happening today you want to see what's happening today you can do sort of a how it all began but you do need to talk about what's going on today um, and so we we started with that we had another church it was really neat they had a huge heart for children <clears throat> and they were going into public schools and they, they're just everyday believers, Sunday school teachers, moms, were volunteering and they were going to all these public schools. And this one little girl uh, heard about Jesus because they were telling them the Bible stories. And she, she had lost her mother as a young child, so she didn't have a mom. And her dad was really struggling with addiction and crime. There was a lot of crime in their area, and so there was a lot of violence in their neighborhood. And she'd never heard about Jesus before. And she heard about him in her public school at this after-school program through these believers. I think it was a, a, a lady in her 50s or 60s who shared with this little girl. And this little girl, she was so excited and she accepted Christ. Um, she prayed to accept Jesus. This was after coming for several months to this club. 
that she told her dad and she told her grandparents and she said, dad, I want to go to this church. I want to keep learning about Jesus. I really want to do this. And she just became a little evangelist in her family. And then she got into kickboxing and all this stuff. And she became a kind of a little celebrity and she wear her Jesus shirt to all the matches and she's inviting people that she's going to the matches to church. And so we started the story with her because it was just those people's faithfulness to go and share with the children. And now this whole, this girl and her dad and her dad got saved at the church and her grandparents came and they got saved at the church. And just how the Lord has transformed uh, this one family. And then we talked about the rest of the church and all the other things they do, but that was such a neat way to start that story. So there's no limit, there's no age limit. You can start with a child, you can start with an older person. Um, um, and you will bring in the history of the church. It may just be a paragraph, it may be a whole section, it just depends. Was it a really amazing story of how the church got started? Were there some bumps and hiccups that they learned a lot and now it's affecting how they do ministry? So you kind of have to make those judgment calls. Um, um, and as I'm listening, sometimes I'll ask the pastor, what makes your church body unique? What is the heartbeat of your church? What is the passion of your church? And um, it's fun because I, sometimes they haven't even thought about that in so many words, you know, sometimes. But they will know because they're the shepherd of the church and they're watching and they're seeing what the Lord's doing. Um, so what's their passion? Is it evangelism, homeless ministry? Is it children? Do they have a lot of teens serving? Do they have a special needs ministry? Sometimes you can tell by their website. So we always, when we're going to do a church feature, we go to the website. We look around and poke around. If they have a Facebook page, definitely go there and read what they've been posting, what they've been taking pictures of, what their people have been commenting about. Um, Facebook has become a really good resource just for the pulse of what everyone's excited about. Uh, today, what's going on today. Um, so on your sheet you have some questions for the senior pastor. You will ask how the Lord started the church, what makes the fellowship unique, what have been some major victories and challenges. And a lot of people like to talk about the victories, but the challenges might be hard, but ask anyway. Even if you have to ask a couple times, right? Um, because there's a lot of learning that happens in challenges. and probably most of the readers who are reading it are going through challenges. Um, and when a lot of times people will speak in generalities, and we've talked about this with any interview, oh, God's doing amazing things at our church. Really? Like what? Oh, just, just people just being blessed, right? We hear this a lot. How? Uh, you know, and then they'll have to think. Right? They'll have to think, can you give me an example? Oh, we have all these families. We have all these young families coming, and they're just on fire for the Lord, and they're getting saved and baptized together. Can you give me an example of a, a family that did that? Oh, well, let me think about that. And they might have to think, and they might have to do some digging and find out the person's name and their phone number or whatever, and that's fine. That's good. You want that. As you're digging, you're trying to find what is the evidence of God working in this church. And talk to as many people as you have to to find that, you know. Um, what is God's heart here? Um, how, and remember we talked about how the things you're sharing in your article, they are evidence. Almost think of, you know, you're writing and an unbeliever is going to read this. And you're trying to prove that God is alive. That he is working among his people. And that you are going to show them by examples and testimonies and stories. And so we can't have something like, God is really blessing our church. Okay, but how? When? Where? What does that look like? What's your proof of that? And I wouldn't say that to the person you're interviewing, what's your proof? <laughs> but you know that that's what you're looking for as a writer, because you are first an investigator. Before you are a writer, you are an investigator. You have to do as much research as you can online and then you have to use interviews as your main tool to get that information from people. And some people are, are, are used to being interviewed and some people are not. And, but you, it's your job to pull that as much as you can. Um, uh, yes, ma'am. Um, if, if a person knows they're going to be interviewed, you can, uh, you can front load them so that they're not so nervous. Mm -hmm. um, they, and they have some maybe time to think about it. Correct. Yeah. 
I, I like to do that. Um, we had talked about sending your interviewee some questions beforehand. It's a really nice thing to do. Um, it, and, I, and you would tell them, here are some of the questions I'm going to ask you, because as they talk, you'll, you'll hear follow-up questions, mm -hmm. right? Like, oh, we started this amazing outreach in a neighborhood near the church four years ago. Well, now you have a question. Mm -hmm. Well, tell me about it. Like, what have been, what's been the fruit? What have you seen God doing in that? So, but it is a really nice thing to do to send them as many of the basic questions as you can. I would not send more than six questions because you're going to make them panic. <laughs> They're going to see this big, long list of questions. And as they talk, you may realize all the stuff you were going to ask is maybe you didn't need to ask it. Maybe mm -hmm. they are going to tell you about some other aspect of their life or the ministry that you didn't think about. So I just, I would send between maybe like four to six questions. You know, what have you seen the Lord doing at your church or in this ministry? Can you give me some examples of how the Lord has done this? Um, can you think of any scriptures? That is a nice question to ask them beforehand because some of, some of us have a hard time just remembering a scripture on the spur of the moment. Mm -hmm. Are there any scriptures that show or demonstrate or are relevant to what God is doing and why? You know, so they'll realize they'll need to explain that. So just questions like that are really good. And plus, you're right, they do help the subject to start thinking ahead of time, start chewing those things over, and a lot of thinking, as much thinking as they can do ahead of time, they'll be more prepared and they'll be ready to, to give you that. Um, I always ask the senior pastor, what other leaders or people should I talk to about what God's been doing here? Because sometimes I remember some church, they had a man who had started a ministry going into the local parks and praying for people, which sounds really simple, but it was it blew up into this huge, amazing ministry because they would put out posters, do you need prayer? We'll be at the park this Saturday. And they'd go to a neighborhood and they would, do, and so they had this prayer team that would go to the park. And I don't remember if they were called prayers at the park or prayer warriors at the park or what they were, but all these people came to the park to get prayer. And so they had, then they, he had like a dozen people volunteering and he, they were reaching like hundreds of people. Um, and so, of course, he was the guy I needed to talk to, but I didn't know that when I first started making my calls. So I asked the pastor, what are some ministries that are really flourishing and thriving? Oh, well, we have prayers at the park. It's really great. Well, can you tell me about it? Well, I don't really go. Well, who does go? So-and-so. Can I call him? Sure. So there I got my, the person that really could tell me what God was doing because he was the man on the ground. Um, um, and then others... When we're looking for that person to start the story with, you might want to ask the pastor or one of the other people on staff, can you think of someone whose life has been radically changed here at this church? And they might tell you, you know, oh, Joe Smith, you know, he's... And so then you'll call this person. So you're going to ask Joe, what, what has God really done in your life through this fellowship? Oh, he's changed me. He's just set me free. Okay, Joe, how? You know, and you're, and you're digging. Oh, well, I was addicted to drugs. Well, what was it that helped you become free from that? And just to get him talking and telling you. And I like to ask people, where were you before God intervened in your life? And then what did he do and how did he do that? You know, um, because then they have to remember and they have to go back. Well, I didn't understand grace. Ah, what helped you understand grace? You know, and, and then they'll share. So you're, you're digging, 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 digging for God's heart. And it might take some time. <laughs> it might take several people. Um, and sometimes people, they, they talk on the surface, and then you have to, you have to dig and dig. And, and most of the time, if you dig enough, you'll, you'll hit, you'll hit that, that underneath all the surfacey stuff. You'll hit what the Lord was doing, how he was reaching in and doing surgery in that heart. Maybe 5% of the time, they either can't vocalize that, or they just, maybe God's not done. They don't have anything to say about that, or that just wasn't their experience. Okay, so after you've dug and dug, and then you hit a wall, you say, okay, it was nice talking with you. But I always try, as hard as I can, to just, to try to find what the Lord did. And um, um, we'll talk about some interview challenges later. Okay. 
So that's church feature. Some examples that you can look at in the magazine are Calvary Chapel Budapest. We had a nice church feature on them, issue 61. Rock Newark, uh, issue 64, was a really neat, is a really neat church in a, in a rough neighborhood. And uh, we talked a lot to the pastor and his wife about how do you help people who have such life-changing issues. You know, they, they're, they're worrying about somebody in their family getting shot. They're worrying about someone in their family who's in jail. I mean, how do you touch people who are coming from such a, a difficult place? And so that was wonderful because we let the pastor and his wife kind of instruct the reader and say, well, this is how you... And I remember the pastor's wife said the neatest thing. She said, you have to go after women like that. You have to go to their house and sit on their couch and fold laundry with them. And then they'll open up to you because they've never had anyone care about them. They've never had anyone come and sit next to them and look in their eyes. You might have to take them to the grocery store because they don't have any way to get there. You know, and, and so just really instructive and helpful things. Um, we had a great story on Calvary Chapel Stone Mountain, a church in the Deep South in Georgia, in issue 14. And we had a, a, a story on Calvary Chapel La Habra in issue 28. Um, so those are some great examples. All right, another type of story is our outreach or mission trip story. Um, these are great stories because they help the American readers understand what's going on in other countries and how the Lord is impacting. And they also can be really instructive for uh, someone who wants to go on the mission field or go on a mission trip. This is what was working for them. This is what they did. And sometimes people get ideas from that. Oh, digging a well. Why didn't we think about that? Or, oh, that's how they did their feeding ministry. Or So these can be great um, uh, stories, they also can be really challenging because a lot of times um, when you're talking to the mission team members, they want to talk about how they were impacted. We talked about that before. They want to talk about, I went to Mexico to bless the people, but the people blessed me. Okay, that's nice, but we're not going to use that as a quote, <laughs> right? And we talked before about what is God's heart for these people? Like if a team went to Nepal, um, our God's heart, the focus of the story is not on the team members who went to Nepal and their experience and the food that they liked or how that they realized Americans are so blessed and these poor Nepal people are so persecuted. They're, the focus is how did God touch people in Nepal? What did he do on that trip? How did the gospel impact the people of Nepal? And you're looking for, well, what is the major religion in Nepal? What does that mean? What are some of their practices? If they have some exposure to the gospel, what is it? Is it mostly a traditional religion? Has it been mixed in with voodoo? You know, what, what is that spiritually? And anyone I can talk to who has been in the country for any length of time, I will say, well, what is the challenge for people in this country to come to Christ? What is their, their, what is their concept of God? You know, and I, I remember talking to someone who lives in Colombia and just them saying, well, we, we worship Castro. <laughs> you know, the government was our God. And, and to hear them say that, you know, a person who grew up in, I'm sorry, it was Cuba. Mm -hmm. To hear them say that was really eye-opening. Oh, because Americans don't know what it's like to grow up in a communist country where you basically worship the government or the, the leader almost as your God. But we need to understand that. And, you know, often I think maybe the Lord will use the reader to pray for this country. If I give the reader enough information about God's heart and the spiritual challenges of that country, then these people will know how to pray. And maybe the Lord will call one of them to the mission field. And that's happened, which is really exciting. That's happened. People have read Calvary Chapel magazine who already had a heart for missions, and the Lord showed them where to go. That's exciting. Um... So with the mission trip stories, you definitely want to share testimonies of changed lives. And it can take some work to find these um, because a lot of time the team member, uh, the team leader, he's the logistics guy. So he's mm -hmm. the one who can tell you, well, we went to 27 villages in eight days and <laughs> we showed the Jesus film eight times and we fed 500 people at each stop, you know, and he's your numbers and logistics and what happened and where. And all that's important because you have to sort of explain that to the reader. But is that the heart of the story? No. Those are 
details, right? So, well, can you tell me about someone who accepted Christ? Um, yeah, there was a lady at this first village we went to, and she was talking to this guy on the team, and she gave her life to Christ. Well, do you know what they talked about? No. Well, can I have the number of the guy who led her to Christ? Oh, yes, because see, that's who you need to talk to. So a lot of it is you're looking for the right person, you're digging, you're trying to find the testimony of change lives. Also, you're trying to get your interviewee to take you there to remember. And sometimes just getting them to talk about it, even if it seems a little silly, but the more they remember, the more they're going to remember. And then something good will come out. So I remember talking to a lady I said, you know, they, they had a huge heart for the children of this country. I think it was El Salvador or I can't remember. They had a huge heart for the, the children. And I um, said, so, well, what did you do for the children? Oh, we had BBSs and we had skits and it was amazing. Okay, well, did they seem to really impact the kids? Oh, yeah. Well, how did you see that? I know you felt that, right, in the moment. But if I'm looking for evidence, how did you see that, you know? Well, I mean, you could tell that some of the kids were p paying attention. Do you remember a certain, and at first when I asked this lady, she couldn't remember a certain child. But as I kept asking her, well, well remind, tell me how did you start your BBS? Tell me what was the skit about? Well, tell me, you know, and then she remembered that this girl who had come to, this, to their gathering, she came to kind of see what was going on, but also to make fun of it. She was a teenage girl. And so at first she was mocking the skit and mocking this lady who's, you know, she's doing a puppet show and she's sharing the gospel and she's got a translator and she's got a lot going on and this girl is heckling and, and making fun of her. And she said, but you know what? Right in the middle of that, the Lord just put on my heart, this girl needs Jesus. She's like, so what I did was I made her part of it. She was my partner with me. And all of a sudden I was asking her to, you know, hold this or do that or whatever. And she involved the girl. And anyone who's taught Sunday school knows that trick of involving the difficult child, right? And all of a sudden, now they're gonna be your ally, right? So she involved the girl, which was neat. And I thought, oh, that's pretty cool. And then after the skit was over, and so the girl started hushing everyone where she'd been talking. <laughs> she'd been making everybody talk. She starts hushing everyone because she, so the lady can teach. And then uh, they had to leave the area that we're at and go to another area and the girl followed them. And then when they got there, the, they were in a market then, they were in a park next to a public market, and the girl sought this lady out after it was all over, and she said, I want to understand more about this Jesus. And so the lady was shocked. She's like, this is the girl who comes to ask me? And she starts telling her and telling her Jesus loved her, and the girl starts weeping, and the girl gets saved. Now that was a beautiful story. But the lady didn't even remember it until we were reliving it and remembering and what happened and then what happened. And maybe she didn't know that was the kind of story I was looking for, you know. Um, but it was a beautiful story. So the more that you dig and the more you're pulling out those details, um, the better. Um, you have some sample questions um, on page 19. Um, what is the culture like? How did the Lord lead you? What was your vision in ministering? What did you hope to accomplish? But what you're really trying to get to are, what were the most unforgettable or powerful moments where you really sensed the Lord working in a person's life? That is probably your most important question. And sometimes, as I just said, it takes people a minute to remember that, to really think about that. Um, and they might give you three examples, and it's the last one that you can use. So keep, oh, that's great, what else? What was another moment like that? You know, or they'll tell you how someone on the team got food poisoning and they laid hands on them and they prayed and then they were ready to go the next day. Awesome, I'm not gonna use it for this story, mental note. What else did you see the Lord do? What other prayers did he answer? What, what local people did you see responding to the gospel or who seemed touched, visibly touched. And you want to ask them, how did you know they were touched? Were they weeping? Were they laughing? Were they nodding their heads? Because again, you're looking for evidence, not just a bunch of American Christians went down there to try to feel good and do good, but what is the evidence that God did something? And it's there. That's the thing. It's there. He did something. You just have to find it, right? Um, 
this was a question that I asked. This group had been going to a Central American country for five years. And I thought, five years? They have learned some lessons about how to reach out in that country. So I said, what were some things that you learned the hard way not to do? Like, what, what, are you, what did you change as far as how you started reaching out? And they gave me some great answers. Well, we learned not to do this. We learned to be more specific about this. Or we learned to present the gospel this way. Or we learned that these, these folks really respond to the Jesus film. But then you have to come after and explain it. Um, I interviewed a guy who's been going to Montreal for 12 years. He's been leading teams. And this is a French-speaking country. It's got the lowest uh, percentage of born-again Christians in all of North America, the Quebec province in Canada. So I asked Pastor George Small, um, he's in Fitchburg. I said, well, what have you learned after 12 years of going to Montreal? He said, you know what? We, we tried all these big concerts and big productions and big things, but you know what really has had the most fruit is having people dress up as clowns and hand out flyers and say, come to the park with your kids. We have cotton candy, we have stories, we have clowns. And then families who had nothing to do that day or they're out you know, already, they go and they come and they come for hours. And every half an hour they stop all the fun stuff, they share the gospel. And then they go back to the fun stuff. And he said, that's been our most fruitful. I said, that's amazing. That's so instructive, you know? You don't have to spend thousands and thousands of dollars on a band and a this and a stage. and a, That this is what really people are, then they're having the one-on-one -on -one conversations. Then they're listening to the gospel message, you know? And so uh, that was just really neat. Okay, so the, there's your... Some examples of outreach stories, mission trip stories. There's a Cambodia story in issue 64. There's a Calvary Chapel Siegen, which is a German church, going to Poland in issue 27. <clears throat> there were several stories about Mexico in issues 28 and 29. And our early issues of the magazine were all missions. <laughs> it was just cover to cover missions with hardly anything in the States. So, <clears throat> All right. Now going on to disaster relief stories. These are very hard stories because something really awful happened. And our other writers could tell you these are hard ones. Um, we have done stories on uh, the shooting in Las Vegas, a school shooting in Florida. That's an awful thing to have to talk to people about. We've done stories on a tsunami. Um, uh, we've done, of course, we did uh, the 9-11 stories, done a few of those. Um, so these are really difficult. Uh, even I would classify our refugee stories in this because people are, f they were fleeing from ISIS and they had been bombed and they had been shot at and so they're traumatized and there were masses and masses of people and how the believers were reaching out to them. So disaster relief stories. So you're trying to keep a spiritual pers perspective the disaster stories are centered around ministry, what Christ has done through his church, and not really the focus on the disaster itself, right? And that is a big difference between Calvary Chapel Magazine's approach and the secular media. You know, the secular media is going to focus on how much damage that hurricane did, and how many people died, and how awful it was, and how horrible. But in Calvary Chapel Magazine, we're going to talk about what Jesus did to rescue people, to save their lives, to give them comfort, to make a church the sanctuary where they were welcomed and they were fed and they were um, ministered to. Um, so that's a huge difference from secular journalism. Before you interview anybody for a disaster story, you really need to acquaint yourself with that disaster. You don't wanna call someone who's been through a traumatic event and say, what date was that that the hurricane hit your city? No you have to become a little expert on that disaster pretty quick. You have to find out how many cities it hit, how long did that hurricane last, how many homes were flooded, how many people died. You really should know that before you call how many people died. Um, um, just what some of the biggest impacts were on their community. Um, look through reliable news sources just to learn what, when, where the major events happened, how many casualties wounded, displaced people, and you need to figure out, and this can be challenging, what is the current state of things today, the day that I'm interviewing this, this person? Are there still hundreds of people without power? Are there still hundreds of people without their homes, right? You have to 
because uh, you are entering into their world and, and you want to ask them deeper questions than just the surfacey things. So some things with the disaster stories, a lot of times the local news has been there or even the national news has been there with their microphones in people's faces. And that makes our job a little harder because we need to let the person know we're not the secular news. We're just because we want to hear about Jesus. We want to hear about what Jesus has done. We want to hear about how has Jesus used you to help the community or how has Jesus miraculously showed up, miraculously showed up or answered a prayer, or provided food or and so you want to immediately get the focus on the Lord. And a lot of times just saying, will you pray for our conversation if it's a pastor or you pray. Just a lot of times just praying at the beginning of the interview will help do that. Another thing that's a challenge with the disaster story is that the people you're talking to, they're still there, usually. And they were traumatized, or they are still being traumatized, or they're exhausted from ministering to so many hurting people. So they're emotionally very raw. And as an interviewer, <laughs> that that makes our jobs a little more challenging. You want to be sensitive and just, you know, be a Christian first. You're a Christian first. You're led by the Holy Spirit. You have compassion for this person. You have a gentleness with this person who's obviously exhausted or traumatized. Let all that, all that can come through in the interview. Um, and if they need a minute, you know, a lot of times if you've been if you've ever been in a disaster situation and you're serving and you're serving and you're just trying to survive and then you stop and someone starts asking you deeper questions, what have you seen the Lord doing? Uh, they're going to need a minute, right, to just stop and think. And you might need to really help them. I, I don't know. I mean, he's done so much. Well, like, what are some of the things that have surprised you? Oh, goodness, he answered prayers every day. Really? What did he answer? Just we would need stuff, and then we'd pray, and then it would show up. Really? What, what kinds of things? Like food? Well, can you tell me a specific? Well, one day we needed water, and we prayed, and this cup, this, uh, this truck filled with uh, cases and cases of water showed up that day. Well, there you go. There's your evidence, right? Um, how did he provide food? Do you remember? Oh, yeah, there was this the first night, this is from the Houston story, the first night they had all these people there in the church who needed to sleep there because the church was above the water and their homes had been flooded. And they said, all we had were like the snacks you have for your Sunday school classes. Like we had some granola bars, we had some crackers. So we had all this, we put all our food together and we're looking at it and we're like, Lord, we've got hundreds of people here. How do, can you multiply the granola bars? And this lady called them and said, I have all this food from this restaurant. They want to donate hot, a hot meal, fajitas. And, but there's no way to get through uh, by driving it. And so then this other guy called and he said, I have a boat. Is there anything you need me to bring? And so I said, great, can you bring all this hot food from this restaurant? And so this man went, got the food, brought it, and they fed 300 people a hot meal with you know, chicken and beef and all, you know, that night. Now that's, that's an evidence of the Lord. So it's wonderful, just but you might have to help them remember, dig a little bit, wait, give them time. Um, sometimes it's really a challenge just to get in touch with them, right? Because they're in the food tent serving people, or they're been up, they've been up since 5 a.m. doing this and that and the other thing. So sometimes that's a challenge. So just be very patient, be very persistent, um, and just know that your person that you're talking to has probably been through a lot, and, um, but don't be too timid to ask them questions. What was the, what was the hardest thing that happened? And that, that, I wouldn't start with that question. You know, we talked about the easy questions first, the general questions first, and then the harder questions. Um, but always, always, what did you see the Lord do and can you give me examples? Always that question. That's where you're always going. Um, Sometimes I will ask them if what the news is reporting online or you know on TV if they feel like that's an accurate representation of the situation. Because I know we had a story on Puerto Rico relief, and there was a lot of funny publicity about that disaster because President Trump went down, and then people were saying all this stuff. And so we were just trying to figure out what is the going on, what is the situation, and so the writer did all the. 
uh, research that she could online, but knowing, well, these sources might be a little biased or there might be something they're not, and maybe that their sources weren't fully informed because they hadn't bothered to call the people who were on the ground, you know? So um, sometimes I will ask, is the situation any different than what is being reported? Or what else do you see that's really not being told, especially from a spiritual perspective? And I remember with the Houston story, people were, they were rescuing people from their rooftops. People had crawled out onto their rooftops and, um, and uh, other neighbors with canoes or jet skis were going out and rescuing people and bringing them. And it was this amazing network of the community coming together but then also there were those divine interventions where, oh, there's a church, and how the firefighters, once they found out that Calvary Chapel Houston was taking people, then they started, the firefighters started bringing people to Calvary Chapel Houston, which is really a neat part of the story, because they saw, this is a sanctuary. We can bring people here. And, um, and then the pastor and his wife just talking about, how do you minister to somebody who comes into your church soaking wet, scared to death, um, traumatized, you know, and, and uh, I remember Yanni said, well, we would wrap them up in a warm uh, blanket or a warm towel. How did you think to do that? How did you, we had a dryer, we'd throw all the towels in the dryer, and then we'd use the warm towels when they first came in, and, and just, you know, she's like, that, that was really, they really appreciated that, because they were freezing cold, and they were stressed out, and that just sort of was almost like, and you know, that's a small detail, but it shows you they weren't treating people like just a number. Like, oh, just this crowd, let's move them through like cattle. But they were taking the time to be very personal and um, compassionate, which is how Jesus is with people. So um, I thought that was a really important part of the story, just that, that tenderness and that compassion that they had with the people who were coming to them. Um, and then usually with the disaster story, you're going to have to find out um, do you have a website or a link or something where if people want to come with teams or if they want to give donations or if you have specific prayer requests, where are the updates on these things? And that's, um, so you always want to have that at the end of your story. Okay, now, page 21. Stories of tragedy, loss, or illness. There are some similarities with disaster stories with these kind of stories. Uh, but sometimes there's been time that has gone by, so the person has had more time to reflect. Um, but still, I just really want to emphasize that with these stories, um, it takes a lot of sensitivity to the Holy Spirit. Would you guys like a break now, or would you like to um, keep going? I'm fine. Keep going. Okay. So with tragedy, loss, or illness stories, um, it's really important to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit because what you're asking the person to remember and talk about might be the most horrible thing that they've ever gone through, or at least it's very painful. And you almost become just a very compassionate listener. You almost, um, the Lord might even use the conversation or the interview to bless or help that person you're interviewing. I'm amazed at once you're talking to someone about a very deep, painful thing that they've gone through, and then you ask them things like, well, how did the Lord reach you? How did the Lord touch you? What did the Lord speak to you? And they start remembering. Sometimes they'll cry. Sometimes they will say, wow, I never, I never put that together, that the Lord did that right at that time. You know, they might have a really um, important moment in that conversation, spiritually speaking. And that's wonderful. And a lot of times, with because we're talking about the Lord with people and we're talking to them about real things or difficult things that they've been through, um, it's a spiritual moment. It's a God-ordained moment. And we it's a privilege. Sometimes you get to be the instrument just by asking questions. And that made more sense to me when I was doing the chaplain story. Because I would have conversations with people and hang up the phone and think, whoa, <laughs> you know, that was amazing, like, and I'm crying, and they're crying, and, and then I did, we did this chaplain story, and Pastor Jerry Paradise of CC Philly said, you know, a lot of times what we learn in chaplain ministry is just to be a good listener, and just let people talk, and let them open up, and don't interrupt them, and just let them remember, 
and let them process. He said, you know, some people process verbally and until they have someone listening, someone who's going to just let them say whatever. And if you're a, non a non-biased party, if you're not a family member or if you're not someone who is involved in the loss, sometimes they'll be able to tell you more because they don't have to worry if they're going to hurt your feelings or if they're going to upset you. And, and, when, and he said, he said um, that he went on a drive along with a, a police officer. Um, it was some horrible tragedy. I don't know if it was a school shooting or what it was. But it was a really awful thing that happened in the community. And he went on this drive along with this police officer and he said he asked him like one or two questions and the guy talked for almost two hours straight. And then uh, he saw him again and he said, oh, hello. And he said, you know, you were the best counselor I've ever talked to. And he, and he thought, you know, all I did was listen. So in an amazing way, sometimes with these stories, we're just a listener and the Lord's going to use that. And he's going to do something way beyond a story, an interview for a story. He's going to do something deep in that person's life. So if that starts to happen and the person starts to cry or, you know, just, you just listen. And it's okay. It's not your fault for making them cry. You don't need to comfort them and go, oh, never mind, never mind. I'm sorry I asked that question. Just let them pause. Let them remember. Let them relive it. Um, I never push people uh, if they say, I don't really want to answer that question. I say, okay. You know, we're not the secular media. We're not some talk show that's trying to make people cry on camera. We're, if someone doesn't want to go there, that's fine. And we respect that. Um, but don't be afraid to ask difficult questions because it's amazing what people will share with you. It's amazing because they know it's a Christian magazine and because they know that it could help someone who's in the same situation. I've, I've interviewed maybe five women now who had an abortion and they're believers now. And to ask them about that experience is asking them to relive the most shameful, most hurtful, most awful thing they ever went through. And I am amazed at the courage of these ladies that they have told me these things. And they're doing it because, not because they want to relive that, but because they want to help someone to not go through that. Or, to, or someone who has gone through it, they want to show them, Jesus can meet you there. He will forgive even that. You know, and so a lot of times I'm blown away by the privilege that we have as the interviewer, as the listener, and God is just doing this amazing work, and these people have this courage to share stuff, and I think, how did she have the courage to tell me that? You know, what she was feeling, what she was going through, the spiral that her life took after it happened, you know? Um, so always be, you're, you're, again, you're looking for the Lord's heart, you're looking for how did he reach into that miry clay and pull that person out and set their feet on the rock of Jesus. And you do want to hear all the details as much as they're willing to share with you, right? Um, so always do this with gentleness. Um, it's okay to speak in a soft voice. It's okay to pause while they're pausing and just wait for them to... Sometimes I've been interviewing people and I'll ask them a question and there'll be this long pause. And my first inclination is to say, did you understand the question? Or I'm sorry, was that too personal? My, my inclination is to fill in the pause. But what I don't know is they're on the other line praying and, and crying and saying, Lord, what do I say? And if you wait, if you let them have that pause, a lot of times the stuff that comes out of their mouth, it's just so anointed by the Lord and that they've let their guard down and they're telling you those things that are the jewels that are going to be the thing that's going to touch someone's life when they read it you know and that's what we want and so don't be afraid of the pauses don't be afraid to let the person relive a painful event every interviewer is different and some people are very uncomfortable with other people's pain <clears throat> just think of it as you're just on assignment from the Lord. And if this is what he wants for this conversation, just just listen and just do it. It may not be easy. <laughs> you may get off the phone and have to go cry and pray. Mm -hmm. um, but this is not about you, and it's not even about them. It's about the Lord and what he has done for them and what he wants to do for the reader. 
stories about people coming off of drugs, stories about people who have gone through abuse, stories about people who have done something horrible like had an abortion, they are not easy stories to write. They are not easy stories to listen to. But the Lord uses them to bring hope to people in really dark places. And that's, I think, what makes our magazine so different from a lot of others that are kind of just puff pieces and it's all happy stories and it's all almost like hype, you know? But we're talking about real stuff. We're talking about cancer. We're talking about human trafficking. We're talking about abortion, you know? And I think those are the kind of stories that change people. So keep in mind that even if the person, even if it was 20 years ago, one of the ladies I interviewed who had had an abortion, it was 35 years ago, and she had been in women's ministry for 30 years, um, ministering to women who had had abortions, and she had shared her testimony thousands of times, and she still cried when she shared it with me. And so I don't think that for some of these, I, it's just not going to be easy for them. And so just be very patient, and um, um, of course you want to pray with them first. If I know that I'm going to interview someone about something really difficult and awful, like the death of their child or something, I start praying for them days before, because I know that they are going to have to relive that. And I pray for them for a few days after if they come to my mind, because that's hard. <laughs> It would be hard for you and me, right, to relive our most awful traumatic things. So a lot of times I just bathe it in prayer. Um, as you do with every interview, but especially with these, you want to start by building trust. Oh, tell me uh, how, about yourself. Where, where is your family fellowshipping? Where are you going to church now? Oh, how long have you been saved? And you might not use any of that for your story, but that's okay. You're just making a connection with them and building a friendly rapport with them. When you pray with them, that's going to show them that you are a believer, you are a sister or brother in Christ, that there's, you're a safe person to talk to. Um, a lot of times I'll tell people, um, you will see this article before it runs, so uh, don't worry that there's, I'm going to put something shocking or twist your story or, you know, you'll see it. And that gives some people that it helps them to go, oh, okay, okay, this is my brother or sister in Christ. She's not looking for something, you know, splashy or disturbing or she's, um, so just building that trust is really good first. Because sometimes I think that they need to mentally work up to talking about it. You know, they have to mentally and spiritually kind of work up to it. Now, if they're a pastor and they talk all the time, they might be okay with just a couple minutes of, but if they're someone who's, they haven't shared this story with even their, some of their family members, you know, it's, it might take them a little time to work up to that. So, um, so here are some sample questions. Um, one is for illness. So we've done some stories on people who had cancer or they had uh, something like that. And, and some of the sample questions, now this is after you've had a little bit of nice, easy conversation with them. So then you might say, well, when, when did the person first get sick? Because that's, they're going to go back and they're going to start remembering. And it helps them to remember in chronological order. There's something about the human brain. We need things in some kind of an order. So if you go back to when the person first got sick, and how long were they sick, or what kinds of treatments were, did they do first, and was that difficult, and how did your church family support you, and, and then you go to question number four, do you remember one of the most difficult moments? Now see, they've already been reliving it a bit, and now that'll be easier for them to access that memory and share that with you. And you might have to, if they're just giving you short answers, you might have to pull out, and, and and why was that so difficult? Or, and, and how did the Lord speak to you? And what did he say? And what scriptures did he really use? And why was that so important to you? And you, know, and you might have to pull that stuff out. Or once you ask them, do you remember the Lord doing, they might just talk for 20 minutes straight. And you're just taking notes and you're just listening and you're letting them go, you know? Um, and that's okay. And then uh, 
and make sure you let them get all that out, you know, and, and if you have to ask clarifying questions, maybe write yourself a little note, what year was that, you know, people don't usually tell you what year everything's happening, you kind of have to go back, but you let them get all of the, the heart of it out, the depth of it, the, I don't know, the, the major thing that the Lord was doing, the spiritual part of it out, and then you can go back and ask those detailed questions, or I've even emailed someone in a detailed question, what year did your parents pass away? Because the interview was just so intense that I can get that later, you know? I don't need to interrupt this. Um, and then you always wanna ask, what was one of the most encouraging times, or how did the Lord encourage you, or how did the Lord lift you up? Did he bring a person? Did he give you a scripture? Did he, did he really come through in an especially difficult time? And, and bring it back to um, the blessing, the, the testimony, um, the good part of the testimony. Um, and also, because the Lord does often use our pain to help someone else, I often ask, how has the Lord used you to minister to somebody in that situation? And, and this is where sometimes people, they don't realize how he's actually already started using them to bless other people. And so, oh, well, actually, I mean, I, I, do, I go to the hospital now and I pray with families, you know. Or, and, and so then, you, then you, you're building the full picture, right? And sometimes then they see it and they go, oh, I didn't realize, you know. So I always ask, how has the Lord used them or how has the Lord used this to help them minister to other people? Um, versus, um, and then I like to ask, how can we, if we know someone who's gone through this, the death of a child, um, you know, whatever it is, how can, like, believers minister to somebody in this situation? What's helpful? What's not helpful? Because isn't that so insightful, you know? Well, really it's helpful if people will just come and sit with you. Or it really means a lot when someone brings a meal. Or, you know, just whatever, because then, then you're instructing the reader. So you've given the reader how the Lord is with you in the worst times of your life. You've given them that truth. You've given them some scripture. You, you've got this person's testimony saying God is real. And then you say, and here's how we can come in if there's someone in my life who I know has lost a child or, or had an abortion or whatever. How can I be a blessing to that person? You know. So that's, that's a great thing to bring into those stories. Um, if you're talking to someone about losing a loved one, they're probably going to cry at some point, and that's okay. I like to ask, and this is something the Lord gave me a long time ago when I was working for a secular newspaper and I had to call people on the day that their loved one died. Um, and I just thought, how would I like to be treated if that was me? What would I want someone to ask me if that was me? And so one of the best questions you can ask someone is, can you tell me a little bit about your loved one? And people love to tell you that because it's therapeutic for them to remember that person, but they love them so much. So a lot of times all they've been doing is <laughs> reliving memories of that person. And so when you say, can you tell me a little bit about your loved one? What were they like? Oh, they love that question. You know, and then sometimes they'll cry right then, you know, and but sometimes they'll start laughing. Oh, he was so funny. My son would do the funniest things. And you know, and it's just a really nice way to start that part of the interview. And then say, and how did they pass away? You know, because that's going to be hard for them to talk about. And, um, and then there's all the other questions. Um, when did, one of the most difficult moments, how did the Lord comfort you? Do you remember a time when he especially blessed you or gave you hope? Um, how has he used uh, uh, the situation to open doors to minister to other people? And this is a question that I, I really like to ask. What do you feel is the Lord's heart for people who have gone through a loss or people who have been through the loss of a child or people who have cancer or whatever it is? What do you feel is the Lord's heart? Because they've been that close to the situation. They've learned something about the Lord in that, you know? Um, Okay, so at the bottom of page 22, finding the right lead for tragedy, loss, or illness stories. Because you do have to have some kind of an angle or start somewhere for the story um, to draw the reader in and to explain sort of what is the heart of the story, where is it going. 
So we did a story on uh, the missionary Betsy Ashworth in issue 36. And I don't think I knew this before I interviewed her, but as I'm interviewing her, I found out that she was on the mission field alone because the first time she went on the mission field, her husband left her. And she had an amazing story of she got saved in the States. She, this, this guy helped her grow in her faith. They ended up getting married. They go back to the Philippines where she's from. She didn't want to go back to the Philippines. She wanted to stay in America. That's why she left the Philippines. But she was obedient to the Lord and her husband. She got there. And sadly, her husband ran off with another woman. And so this lady, Betsy, was devastated. Devastated, right? And she didn't know what to do. So we talked about what was that season like? I mean, she was crying. She was calling out to the Lord. She didn't know what to do with herself because now she wasn't a wife. And should she still be a missionary? And should she stay in the Philippines? Should she go back to America? What in the world? Her whole world flipped upside down, and, you know, and heartbroken, just heartbroken. And as she prayed and as she sought the Lord and she went back to the States and talked to a pastor, and the, I think it was the pastor who said, well, what is on your heart? Do you want to go back? to the mission field? Well, yes, I do, because I have this huge heart for the Filipino children in the rural villages, because she had been a rural village child raising her other siblings because her parents weren't there. And so her heart was for those kids. And he said, well, if you want to go back, you're not disqualified for ministry. You're, you, you can go, and we'll support you as a church. And she was so amazed that God would still use her, even as a forsaken woman, with no husband, she went back. She'd been serving there for over a decade, and she just loves Jesus. And um, so, but where do you start that story? Do you start it, she's standing in a village sharing the gospel? Do you start it, where do you start the story? And after a lot of prayer and thinking about it, I started the story with the day that she came home and found the note on the kitchen table. And she just cried out to the Lord, because that was... I feel like in that moment she made a choice to lean on Jesus and not to get angry or bitter or leave her faith or whatever. In that moment she made a choice to call out to the Lord and then how she was encouraged. You haven't done anything wrong. You can, you're not disqualified from ministry. We'll support you as a missionary. And how that was such an important part of her um, having the courage to go back and just that... Um, so that's how we started the story and how the Lord has sustained her and how the Lord has been her husband was a huge part of the story. Um, and that was a difficult moment for her to relive and we had to work up to that in, a, in the interview, but she, she, did, she was willing to tell me you know, what was going through her mind in that moment. Then we had a, a personal testimony about a woman who lost her eyesight and she paints uh, pictures, they're abstract pictures, um, to earn a living and share the Lord. And of course, I asked her about the day that she realized she was going blind. Man, that was a hard thing for her to relive because she started to lose sight in one eye, and that was hard. And then she realized she was losing the other eye. And so she had a big moment with the Lord, like, Lord, are you really going to let me go blind? Are you really going to, are, have you forsaken me? Have I done something wrong? Are you punishing me? And man, those are hard questions, but his answer to her was so loving and kind, and now she is evidence that the Lord had a plan in it. And she was telling me that. The Lord had a plan. I can see it now, you know. And but it was hard, you know. So but we did start with that moment where she realized, okay, not only am I losing this eye, I'm losing my other eye. And um just that wrestling and that um deciding to keep following Christ. Um, and we had a woman who lost her husband in the war overseas, and she has two little children. And, um, and I think we started, because we kind of combined a little nut graph. It was a personal testimony, so it had to be really short. We talked about how when she goes running, that's like her alone time, and she thinks about her husband in heaven with Jesus. And... Um, uh, then we also talked about how one of her hardest moments was when her little boy asked, why did God take daddy away? Whew, 
you know, what do you say? And what did she say? And what did the Lord show her? Then we also talked about how her pastor and other believers in the church have been reaching out to her little boy because he needs a man figure. He needs a, a godly man figure in his life. And so that was really instructive, I think, to just say, hey, if you have someone in your church who's lost a father, and, and it was neat because the pastor was like, we, we do it in a way where it's not going to compromise anyone's integrity or cause any, you know, we, we do it in a safe way. We, we'll send two guys over or we'll, you know, have the guy just go pick up the son or whatever. But, um, but um, that was such a beautiful picture of how the Lord brings his family around his children when there's such a difficult time like that. Um, so anyway, so there's all these... Um, Whew, the human trafficking story we did in issue 67 was really hard. This gal, Marjorie, and I knew that she had told her story many times, so I knew that she was probably ready to share anything I wanted to know. And she ended up becoming an exotic dancer and a prostitute, and so I wanted to get to the root of why. Why would somebody do that? Because I feel like with human trafficking, we need to remember that the victims are people, and that a lot of times they have had a history of abuse, and that's why they don't see themselves as having any value or letting people take advantage of them. And sure enough, she had been horribly abused by her stepfather, and that had broken her heart, and had introduced all these awful things into her life when she was a little girl. And I felt like that was important in a story like this, to, to show this, is, this was a little girl that got broken. This is not just, oh, she's a horrible, sinful woman. Look what she's doing. Oh, <gasps> shocking. You know, but because I think that when Jesus looks at us, he knows why. He knows why is this person broken? What happened to this person? We see that when they lowered the lame man down through the roof and he's lame. So obviously they want Jesus to heal his lameness. And Jesus looks at him and he says, my son, be of good cheer or don't be afraid. Your sins are forgiven you. And I remember reading that and saying, Lord, why would you say that? Why is that the first thing you say? I mean, obviously he wants you to heal his legs. But the Lord just kind of spoke to my heart because that was the first thing he needed to hear. Because in his heart, he was afraid. And he felt like a condemned, awful sinner. And in that culture, a lot of times people thought, well, if you're that sick, you must have done something wrong. God's punishing you. So... As a storyteller, we're the storytellers of the testimonies. What is the root? What is going on? What is, how does the Lord see this person? And um, so that was a difficult story to do, but I think really powerful. And just to show how broken homes, they're part of this whole story with people who get involved in all these awful things and let themselves be taken advantage of. Now to talk about vigilance against errors. This is on page 23 also known as when it's good to be OCD. And really this is important because we're a Christian publication and we're telling real stories and so there cannot be major errors in these stories. Because if we have someone's name wrong, if we have a big detail wrong, that get, it throws our whole, everything into question. Well, are they making stuff up over there? Do they know what they're talking about? Are they doing their due diligence? And so that's why, even though it might seem silly to obsess over how you spell someone's name, is it I-E or E-I, or we have to, we have to, because our integrity is at stake. And really, we're reflecting Jesus. And so we want to be airtight, absolutely airtight, that all of, everything is accurate. So we, just as we guard against false doctrine creeping into the church, we have to be vigilant against errors that can creep into our stories um, because they could lessen our integrity and cast doubt on the stories and testimonies themselves. And the thing about accuracy is it doesn't just happen. You have to be, you have to be so purposeful about it and work so hard. It's amazing. And, and errors come in the funniest ways. I know we've interviewed some churches where they call themselves two different things. And so you're interviewing a pastor and he says the name of his church, then you're interviewing the assistant pastor and he says it differently. And you as the writer go, oh, wait, is it such and such of the such and such? Or is it just, you know? And, and uh, I remember there have been a couple times where we asked them, what is the name of your church? Because on the website it's this, but then you just called it this in the interview. Oh, well, we just kind of go by both. 
well, we have to pick one, and that's what we're going to do in the story because it has to be consistent. Otherwise, we look like we're making this up, you know? Um, so accuracy requires hard work, intentionality, follow-through, and research. It is the writer's responsibility to fact-check their stories, not the editor's. A lot of times the editor is looking at things like flow, grammar, clarity, and the editor is assuming that the writer has checked the name spelling, the title, you know? Um, these are actual examples of errors that we've encountered while editing Calvary Chapel Magazine stories. The name of the church was wrong. The name of the church was wrong name. Um, how did we find it? The editor checked the church website, saw that the church called themselves two different names, called the church, asked them which name they wanted to be called in the story, um, helped them decide which name that they wanted to use for the story. Uh, another one was the title of a ministry leader was wrong. Um, the way we found that was we checked it on the staff website, but a lot of times churches don't have a staff website that has everybody's title or even has been updated recently. Um, so really the writer needed to catch that. Um, a person's name in a caption was misspelled um, and this one we didn't, we, didn't, um, we didn't fix it. It ran incorrectly and um, someone had written the name down wrong in their notes and they said well here's what my notes say and so we went with what the notes said but it was wrong because they never double checked it with the person when they wrote it down. Um, so even though these are little things, they're actually very important. With numbers, we're only specific when we're absolutely sure, when it's really necessary to use a specific number, um, when the numbers won't change bef after or during the publication. Otherwise, you round. That's what you're gonna see with newspapers and magazines and um, uh, you can say six people were on the team, that number's not going to change, that's how many people were on the team, but if you, say, um, if you say 123 people responded to the gospel, that's just odd. You know, did someone stand there and count 123 people? And even if they did, that's a little bit clunky. So we just say more than 100 people, or, you know, or nearly 130 people, or just something like that where we're rounding it, and the readers understand that, and that's common journalistic practice. Um, there's a whole list of information from Reuters, Reuters sorry, on how you can cross-check information. Um, two sources are always better than one. Um, uh, Facebook is nice for name spellings because if you go to the person's own Facebook page, they've probably spelled their name correctly. <laughs> so if you find the name spelling, that's a really tough one. If you find it on the staff website, uh, just go on over to Facebook and make sure they match. Or, you know, have the person, I have people with difficult names spell their name for me on the interview tape so that I have that airtight, it's in my notes, I have a record of it. You had a question, Barb? I do. Um, are you supposed to list your sources? And is there a specific, uh, I know that there's, what is that? Well, we don't Owl do footnotes. tells you how to do. Yeah, we don't do footnotes in our stories. <laughs> Every once in a while, we might have a statistic from mm -hmm. like um, Pew Research Center, mm -hmm. so we'll just put it right there in the sentence with the parentheses. Okay. Like more than fifteen percent of people in this country are evangelical. Pew Research, Research Center. Council, yeah. yeah, we don't, but we don't use footnotes or. So okay. Every once in a while, we have used a footnote if it was like a foreign word and we wanted to. But I like it right there in the sentence. Otherwise, it just gets a little clunky. Um, Okay. Think about the, the source of the information. Like if I'm interviewing someone and they're telling me about somebody else and they say, oh, you know, I can tell you his name or I can tell you what unit he's in in the military or whatever, that's fine, but I'm going to double check it with that person. Because even a, your best friend can spell your last name wrong or get your military unit wrong or whatever. Um, uh, page 24, you're always going to um, check those company names, those church names, those website addresses. Um, um, 
and, and even though Wikipedia is the people's encyclopedia, it can be a nice point for starting your research, but it's not your attributable source. Anyone can put anything on Wikipedia, <laughs> and there's a lot of misspellings, a lot of uh, inaccurate information, so you're always going to have to um, verify that with an expert, with the person who really knows. And any, any good researcher, whether you're researching for an academic paper or a journalistic article, think about, does this person who's giving me this information, do they know? Are they the expert? Are they the one? Are they the best source of this information? Um, um, because a lot of times if they're not, like, oh, well, I saw this person and I think they were talking about this. Okay, I'm going to need that person's phone number so I can ask them. You know, because unless you were standing right there listening to the both sides of the conversation, you might be leaving a, a hugely important thing out. So that's our job. We, we want the accurate story. We want the testimonies to be completely uh, true. Um, we want the names right. We want, we want all of it to be airtight. And one thing that we do that is different than a lot of uh, secular news sources is we do readbacks or we do um, where we'll send, uh, sometimes I'll send a person's quote to them. I might not send them the whole entire article, but I might just send the paragraphs where they're quoted and say, is that, is that what you said? Especially if it's complicated. My sister's third cousin's sister, but you know, once it starts getting too complicated, I say, I'm going to send you that, at least your piece, and you can tell me if that's right. Because um, sometimes people get confused and they're telling you it in a, in a funny order and you think they're telling you the story chronologically but they're actually remembering things that they left out but they're just, they keep going. And so it's easy when someone's, especially over the phone, it's easy to have a miscommunication. It doesn't mean you're a bad uh, interviewer, it doesn't mean your interviewee wasn't telling you the truth, it's just the nature of communication and talking. Um, and some people will f jump all around in the middle of telling you a story and some people will start at the beginning and tell it nicely in this chronological way. But remember, a lot of times you're going back and asking clarifying questions. So the order can get really jumbled. So sometimes I'll say, okay, wait. So first you were in San Diego and then you went to Fredericksburg and then you moved back to San Diego, <laughs> you know? And, and don't feel silly to do that because it can be yeah. quite confusing sometimes, you know? And especially it's hard when we're trying to show those little details that are evidence of God. Um, so first you prayed for water and then, and then it was that afternoon that the truck full of water came and it was how many cases? You know, you have to do that. You have to do that. And um, it's, good, it's good journalism. And uh, don't feel like you're insulting the person by asking them to repeat themselves and don't feel silly. To do that. Um, page 25 is an accuracy checklist. This is just some, some of us like lists. We work better with lists. So for every story that you turn in for the magazine, make sure that every you've gone through every single thing. Is the church affiliated with Calvary Chapel? They might call themselves the Calvary Chapel, but they might not have finished all their paperwork and so they're still considered a fellowship. Um, Go to the Calvary, Calvary Chapel Association website and verify their affiliation. Don't use the Calvary Chapel Association website to check spellings. And because, you know, sometimes whoever's giving them the information is giving it to them wrong or they don't have time, they don't have the staff to check every single spelling of every single thing that's on their website. So don't, don't use them as a source for how to spell things, but do use them as a source for if the church is affiliated as a Calvary Chapel. Um, <clears throat> are all the name spellings consistent and accurate? A lot of people, like my husband, his name is David, but he goes by Dave. Well, in that story, he better be one or the other the whole time. He better either be David the whole time, or he needs to be Dave the whole time. Because if you start changing it, the reader's going to say, wait, is there a David and a Dave? Who's talking now? What's happening? <laughs>